Tonight is uh, session number two in the uh, general topic of outdoor living, and tonight we consider fishing as part of outdoor living. With us tonight, we have a slight change in the schedule. As listed, Craig Jackson and his father-in-law, Dan Tillema, were to be here to be talking about bass fishing uh, on the original plan. They have backed out, and I don't see either one of them here. If you're here, stand up. They're not here. That's all right. <laughs> I really didn't think they would be. But as a special treat, Father Bannett came all the way up from Texas to tell us about bluegill fishing, so we have some speakers worthy of your presence. To start it out, Mike Schoonfeld is a, and correct me if I'm wrong, a biologist, state of Indiana. Um, his job is doing this sort of thing full time. He's going to be talking to us this week about fishing and what's available in Indiana, on how you go about it and what do you do, and next week he'll be talking to us about hunting. So he gets to do that sort of thing full time. Those of you who are biology majors, uh, see there's something else you can do with your degree. All right, Mike, where are you? Thank you, everybody, for having me uh, here tonight, Dr. Ehler in particular. Um, one thing I want to uh, let you know right off the bat is that uh, although I may not look like a, a real old guy, I'm, I'm sort of from the old school, and uh, I was recently at one of the DNR meetings, and we had one of the young female biologists <coughs> giving a, a presentation uh, about a survey of of anglers that she did across the state and after she was about three-fourths of the way through the her presentation I found that, that uh, one thing I kept noticing she even though she was talking about fishing and uh, and to, to people that like to go fishing she never once used the term fisherman and she, it was always anglers, and so I asked her after what, the, the thing was over if that was some sort of new politically correct term, uh, and, and I was, it was. And so, uh, <laughs> anyway, you know, fishermen, I have uh, always been used that as, a, as sort of a generic term, you know. I mean, this young lady can be a fisherman, and, and I don't use fishermen and fisherwomen, and I don't always use anglers. So don't take offense if I'm not exactly politically correct and I happen to say fisherman during the talk instead of angler or fisher person or, or something like that. When Dr. Ayler asked me to come, um, I wasn't real sure just exactly why um, he wanted me to get here because uh, besides being a, a biologist, I, I'm one of the managers over at Willow Slough Fish and Wildlife Area. I'm also an outdoor writer and, and uh, for a number of publications, but in particular for the little newspaper guide that comes every Monday in your, um, in your mailbox, uh, I, I write the Mike's Outdoor World column in that paper. And um, so I, I wasn't sure whether uh, Dr. Ayler called me because uh, he knew he'd, he'd been reading my guides and was one of my fans, or uh, just got my name off of a roster someplace uh, as one of the DNR people that lived in the area. And, um, and rather than, you know, put him on the spot and ask him, well, you know, how come you picked on me, um, I decided I would just sort of cover both aspects. One of the things that I do in my outdoor communications um, work, besides uh, my work with the DNR, is I do give some uh, fishing seminars at, at some of the sporting shows and, and things like that. Uh, so it's not completely out of um, out of my uh, field. And I also give presentations because I work for the DNR. So I, I drove my DNR truck over here tonight and, and I wore my civilian clothes, see? So I'm sort of doing both, uh, both aspects. First off, as a DNR guy, uh, I want to cover a few of the biological aspects dealing with, with fishing and dealing with fishing regulations. Um, and, and in some cases, biology 
has something to do with the fishing regulations. In some cases, biology doesn't have hardly anything to do with the, the fishing regulations. There's other factors that come into play. But <clears throat> I can't really cover a whole lot of fish biology. You know, when I was in college down at Purdue, you know, we had several courses that dealt with uh, fisheries biology and different aspects of fisheries biology. The, the limnology is the study of the water and, and just fish identification and, and you know, a whole uh, uh, field of, of things that uh, took a whole semester uh, to cover and, and so I can't in 40 or 50 minutes, you know, give you a, a real giant view of uh, fisheries biology, but there's one concept that's, that's somewhat fairly easy to grasp, and it's one of the major concepts that fisheries managers and fisheries biologists have to deal with, and uh, in almost every fisheries project that, that they're dealing with. And that has to do with the, um, the, made the, the productivity of a given body of water. So I'm going to use that as my little fisheries biology lesson for tonight and um, and then maybe use that to branch into some other uh, other little sidelines. Basically, a certain lake or a certain pond or a certain body of water will produce a certain amount of fish. Now, Mother Nature doesn't really care what kind of fish are in the lake, and it doesn't. She doesn't particularly care how uh, how many fish are in there. It's going to produce a certain number of pounds of fish. Uh, say you have a pond, and it will hold 10,000 pounds of fish. Uh, that can be 520 pound fish, or it can be 20,000 half pound fish, or or 50,000 quarter pound fish or whatever the, the arithmetic works out to, but it's going to basically be able to produce the same amount of fish. Now, from a fisherman's point of view or an angler's point of view, start off bad right off the bat, it's a question of, of getting the, the right amount of fish and the right species of fish to make fishing in this pond or this lake uh, interesting and, and enjoyable and productive. <clears throat> now, part of the reason that, that, you know, that people fish nowadays is for the enjoyment of it, but originally fishing was basically a method of, of harvesting something that was good to eat. You know, the, the Indians and the cavemen and the, the people that are on subsistence diet may thought it would have thought it was fun to go out and, and uh, knock a big walleye over the head with a rock or however they did it, but uh, on the other hand, they took the walleye home and ate it too because that was, that was how they put, put meat on the table. And uh, nature produces uh, an annual surplus, basically an annual crop. And if you were to look at the amount of fish in a lake, even though this lake they had 10,000 pounds of it, you could go out there at different times of the year. Probably in, the, in these latitudes, if you went out in the springtime, uh, there, it would be depressed. Uh, maybe there will be 8 or 9,000 9, pounds of fish in the lake. And if you go in in September, October, maybe it would be 12,000 pounds of fish in the lake as, as the fish grew and then they died off during the, the uh, stressful part of, of the year. So taking a few fish out of the system doesn't necessarily mean that you're upsetting some sort of magical balance uh, that's out there. You know, even if we weren't out there, there's peregrine, or not peregrine, ospreys and, and seagulls and turtles and, and other things that are constantly preying on the fish and, and uh, giving into the, the ebb and the wane of, of what's going on in an in a ecosystem out there. Fishermen are just part of that ecosystem, at least in modern times, they are. One of the goals of a fisheries biologist or a fisheries manager then, in 
uh, today's world is to uh, is to set rules to ensure that a lake that we consider or fishermen would consider to to be a well balanced lake remain a well balanced lake and another goal is if there is a lake that is out of balance it may be that setting certain regulations may be able to restore some balance to the lake <coughs> some examples of um, <coughs> Of regulations that may be in effect in a lake that has a has a real good balance uh, might be that fishermen are permitted to take all the bluegills that that they wish to take out of a lake but they're limited to only catching six bass a day uh, bluegills are one of the more productive fishes in the lake harvesting some of those means that uh, they can easily be replaced <coughs> in the natural cycle of and uh, bluegills fecundity or uh, they make lots of little babies. Largemouth bass are less productive, they're less numerous, they also assist in uh, keeping the number of bluegills down in a lake and um, so we don't want to take all the largemouth bass out of the lake so that's just one of the things that one of the a small example that uh, shows how regulations can help keep an imbalanced lake in balance. Now, I'm using bass and bluegills around here because most of the lakes and ponds that, uh, that we fish in through northern Indiana uh, and through most of the Midwest are bass and bluegill lakes. Any place you find bluegills, chances are you're going to find largemouth bass and, and vice versa. But uh, you know, if you go up into Wisconsin, the same factors would be in, in place for walleyes and perch. Uh, or if you went on up into Canada, maybe lake trout and whitefish or something. But uh, preying on the bottom end of the, of the uh, fishermen preying on the bottom end of the, of the food chain is not as likely to upset the balance of a lake as fishermen targeting the, the bigger mm. fish the top predators in the, in the lake. So consequently, most of the time the regulations are less strict on the uh, fish at the bottom end of the, of the uh, food chain of smaller fish in the lake. Now, all these regulations are, are nice, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a pond out there that somebody snuck in and they caught all the nice bass out of. and. Uh, Few people like the bluegill fish in it, and the next thing you know, have a lake that has very few bass and a lot of bluegills that are all only four or five inches long. Now you have a lake that's that's relatively out of balance. There are regulations that can uh, can be enacted that uh, that can help restore this balance on a private farm pond. Uh, what a lot of landowners do is uh, basically they get to set their own regulations. It's private water. You go in there and say, okay, you can't keep any bass that you, you catch. Matter of fact, some people don't even allow bass fishing, but you have to keep every bluegill that you catch and they encourage, you know, come on down and catch them all. Basically, you're thinning out the number of bluegills and letting the, the top predators su survive and get the lake back in balance. On a larger basis, one of the things that um, has been done in the last several years. It's probably 10, 12 year old concept. Now it's been used in Indiana, uh, especially in some southern Indiana lakes where it, it seems to make a little more, uh, more sense or perhaps those are lakes that are, uh, tend to get out of balance a little more easily is, uh, is a slot limit. Now this is not the only one. This is just one that I'm familiar with and I'm going to use as an example. Basically, slot limit on largemouth bass. Again, you're talking about a bass and bluegill um, type of predator-prey relationship. Not that there's not catfish and uh, other predators in the lake and crappies and other um, types of, of uh, prey species in the lake, but basically bass and bluegills are, are quite interrelated. 
uh, biologists went out and they took surveys. Most of these lakes have were uh, the only regulations that applied to taking the harvest of bass. They had to be larger than 14 inches and the fish had to be, uh, you could only catch six a day or keep six per day. And um, after the fisheries biologists went out in the lakes, they found that there were uh, very few bass over 14 inches. You could ask any, ang any of the anglers that were out there, and they'd tell you that there wasn't very many of them. But fisheries guys went out, and they used nets and shocker boats and all sorts of scientific apparatuses like that and found out that the fishermen were, knew what they were talking about, and there was not very many so-called keeper-sized bass. <clears throat> the lakes that this seemed most apparent on were lakes that were fairly large, but they also had quite a large angling, a bit of angling pressure. And <clears throat> for whatever reason, they were lakes where largemouth bass seemed to have good spawns on a regular basis. Uh, basically, every year or three out of four years, weather conditions, spawning conditions were right that the bass that were in there did have babies. So there was lots of babies being recruited into the population. There was lots of people that were uh, out there catching, uh, fishing for the fish. And every time one of those little goobers got up to 14 and an eighth inches long, he got taken home and fried up. So there were not very many 14 inch sized bass, but there were so many bass that were smaller than 14 inches that they started uh, being competitive among one another. And uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a fact of, of stunting, but their growth was not as fast as, uh, as it could have been if it had been a, a, a more healthy uh, situation where there was lots more bass of, of various sizes in the population. So what the DNR came up with was uh, a slot limit on largemouth bass. And basically what that meant, if a bass under Indiana regulations, they use different slots in different states and different sizes depending on, on productivity and how fast their fish normally grow. But in Indiana, um, you could keep a fish that was 12 inches or less, you could keep a fish that was 15 inches or more, but if it was between 12 and 15 inches, it had to be returned to the lake. <coughs> That did a couple of things. Number one, it now allowed people to more regularly catch keeper bass because they could uh, fish for anything that was less than 12 inches. And we've already established that these lakes had a lot of smaller size fish in them. Most guys probably didn't keep many of the six or seven inch fish, but uh, you know you can get a fairly decent fillet off the 10 or 11 inch bass. And if that's what you're out there to do is to get enough uh, fish for a fish fry, why well, that was a, a now a perfectly legal way to, to do it. <clears throat> it also has been proven time and again that uh, bass that are in a 12 to 15 inch size range are in the prime of their life. And what that means, they are the best spawners. They may not have quite as many eggs as some big old 20 inch, six and a half pound female bass would have, but a 20 inch, six and a half pound largemouth bass has done it several times and she gets a little bit sloppy in her old age and doesn't guard the nest as well and doesn't, um, doesn't do her spawning duties quite as well. And, uh, and there's not very many of those bass that size in the lake. So really catching or allowing people to keep those 15 inch and larger fish. Basically the people that are catching those are just taking, you know, what farmers would, would call the spent hens, the ones that have, have uh, are contributing. And you're leaving the best and the most productive fish in the, in the population. And, and that has worked out quite well. The places that they've done it, it has uh, uh, the bass growth rates have shot up and um, 
the, uh, the fishermen are happy, they're catching more fish, uh, more fish fries back at camp going on, so, uh, and, the, and the bass that are in the lake seem to be happier. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a win, win, win situation all, all the way. So that's a, a way that regulations have helped restore what was a little out of a balance situation um, and, and help put things back into the balance that the fishermen like. Now I mentioned that some regulations are more for, uh, for actually they're for more for morality than they are for biology. And I want to touch on those uh, just a little bit. Many of the first regulations that were ever enacted uh, in Indiana and, and, and really in, in this country were uh, basically rules that uh, that dictated how the, the morality of fishing. Uh, I mentioned when you know when the pilgrims came over here, they used any method that they could to get fish out of the out of the, the rivers or out of the lakes because they were using them strictly as subsistence. But once people start fishing just for the fun of it, um, then they felt that there had to be some sort of rules that dictated. Uh, what was legal and what wasn't legal, what was sporting and what wasn't sporting. Therefore, most morality laws have turned out to be laws that stifle efficiency. Um, you can't go out and use gill nets to get fish. You know, it's a very efficient method of getting fish, but it's not very sporting. You, know? uh, you can't take a stick of dynamite, toss it into a deep hole in the river, and um, wait for the fish to come floating out of the bottom of the hole after the explosion goes off. You know, it's a very efficient method, but it's not very sporting, unless maybe the fuse on the dynamite sticks pretty short and be a little sporting. But I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, one of my experiences. Uh, this happened to me as, as an outdoor writer. Um, it was one of those things where you know, ever get in a situation where you get asked a question and, and, and you're caught off balance and you get a, you give the answer and you know like two days later you say, man, you know, I sure <coughs> wished I could say now what I you know what what I'm thinking instead of being caught off balance. But what happened to me? I was up in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and uh, covering a, a fishing tournament that was going on uh, out in Lake Superior. And as one of the uh, one of the few people from the United States that was up there for this Canadian tournament, um, one of the local radio stations got got word that I was in town, and and they were trying to promote the the festival and the the tournament that was going on that weekend. So they invited me to come down and do a little five minute interview on the radio. Um, the morning of the tournament. Now the guy that was doing the radio show, uh, he didn't. He was not a fisherman. He didn't really have much, uh, you know, much knowledge about fishing. Um, but he was doing the best best that he could. And he wasn't really trying to put me on the spot. I'm convinced of that. He, you know, got on there and he had to tell me something and asked me some questions and so we talked a little generalities and then he come up and he said now on these boats that you guys are fishing on well, you, you have uh, electronic fish finders don't you and I said well uh, yeah they, they do and, and he says well that doesn't seem very sporting you know to go out and find them like that and and so you know I try to explain to them a little bit, well, you know, I mean, they call them fish finders, but just because you find them doesn't mean that you can make them bite, and, you know, it's a big lake, and it helps narrow as one of the tools, and, you know, I mean, there's a bunch of different things that I sort of stammered around, and, and you know, we went to commercial, and he come back and, and um, you know, asked about the weather or what the water was like or something, we went on to some other subject, so I didn't... Uh, I didn't feel real comfortable with the answer. I mean, it wasn't anybody that I talked to that heard me that said, boy, you really screwed that answer up like this morning. You know, they agreed with it, but I wasn't real happy with it, and it, and it weighed on my mind for a while. And so finally, I came 
to, uh, I was out fishing and thinking about, you know, how s stupid my answer had been, and I thought, you know what I would have liked to have said? I said, well, let me tell you a little story. And the story, that I, it's just a short little thing. And the guy decided he wanted to go down and catch a fish, so he went down to, to the stream and he saw some fish in there, so he took off all his clothes and waded out into the stream and, and reached down and tried to grab those fish. And all he wanted to do was, was catch a fish. Well, there's some other guy came along and, and he saw the fish out in the stream and he wanted to catch one of them. But he wasn't so sure that getting naked and going out there in the stream was exactly the way to do it, so, so he put on a pair of hip boots. And he waded out into the stream and, and, and he reached down in the water and he tried to catch a fish. And still a third guy came along and, and he didn't have hip boots and he didn't want to get naked, so uh, he took a pole and put a string on it and a hook and put a worm on the hook and he went to try to, to catch the fish that way. Now, should the guy that was naked and trying to catch the fish look down on the guy that was wearing the boots? Because obviously he was not a purist fisherman, you know, he was wearing boots instead of being naked and standing in the stream. And both of those guys could have looked at the guy that was standing there on the bank with a fishing pole in his hand because obviously he was not, you know, he was using tools to catch these fish instead of trying to go out there and, and grab them. Well, the point of the story is that fishing is a lot of things to a lot of people. Now, maybe the guy that was naked in the stream, he was happy as a bug in a rug down there trying to catch a fish that way. And <clears throat> the next guy that came along may have had a $25,000 boat decked out with all sorts of high-tech space-age electronics and, and thousands of dollars worth of lures and, and rods and reels and things like that, and, and they're both going fishing. And who's to say which one was going to enjoy themselves more or less that day? So, so fishing uh, is many things to many people. And, and uh, anyway, I wished I told that story instead of just sort of stammering around telling, well, you know, you can't catch every fish that you see on the little screen and stuff. But it kind of reminds me of the, in, the, in the movie uh, Forrest Gump about, uh, you know, when his friend Bubba and him were first got into the Army and, and Bubba was a, was a shrimp fisherman and, and he started going down the, the list and they say, well, there's deep fried shrimp and the shrimp gumbo and the shrimp cakes and shrimp cocktail and barbecue shrimp and boiled shrimp and broiled shrimp and shrimp cakes. And you know, he went on for days, I guess, talking about that. Well, this, you know, when it comes to fishing, there's lots and lots and lots of kinds of fishing. There's, you know, there's spin fishing and pan fishing and there's bass fishing and salmon fishing and there's big game fishing and saltwater fishing and freshwater fishing and there's ultralight fishing and fly fishing and, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on, the different kinds of, of fishing. But uh, to sort of wind down my talk a little bit tonight, I'm going to talk about some of the basic kinds of fishing. And basically when I thought about it, the kind of fishing is defined, that people are doing, is defined by one of three things. Either it's the, the tools that are being used to do the fishing, what kind of fish is being sought, or what kind of water is being fished. Now, the tools basically is the tackle being used, and in the broadest definition, tackle can be a two cent hook or a $20,000 bass boat, and a whole bunch of stuff in between. Let me tell you, I get catalogs in the mail every day, and there is a bunch of stuff in between, and I own most of it. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't bring very much of it along for show and tell because I, uh, <clears throat> I didn't have time to load it all up and there's not enough space to bring it in. I did bring a few things along to uh, show and tell, but, but not very much. But basically the tools is, uh, is the tackle. Type of fishing is simple. You either use it in a generic sense, or you're, you're going pan fishing, you know, and pan fish may include bluegills or 
perch or sunfish or uh, white bass or, or something like that, or um, going for bigger fish, you know, game fish, you can say you're bass fishing or you're walleye fishing or musky fishing or salmon fishing or something like that. And a type of water may mean uh, salt water, fresh water, whether you're fishing in a lake or a pond, you're fishing in a stream, or you can subdivide these categories, you know, you're, you're offshore fishing in the ocean, or deep sea fishing, or you're fishing inshore, or fishing in a great big river, or you're fishing in a little tiny stream, or something like that. So uh, that's why there's, when you get invited to give a talk on fishing, it's quite a subject. <coughs> now, most modern sport fishing usually encompasses a hook and line. There are legal methods of sport fishing that uh, involve uh, uh, bow and arrows or, or uh, spears or things like that. But you know, when people think of, of fishing, basically they're thinking of, of uh, a hook and a line and a, and a fishing rod of some of some sort. Chances are the first tools, the first fishing rods and reels and things like that uh, were just like in the example that I gave earlier, you know, the guys got tired of standing there waist deep in water uh, before hip boots were even invented and tried to catch fish by hand and they found out that it was a lot easier to take a willow pole and, and tie a, a length of, of string of some sort to it and put a hook or uh, something that the, that the fish would, uh, would bite on and, and pull the fish out of water like that. At least you stayed drier. I don't know if it was any more effective with those crude tools, but it was a lot more comfortable way to, to get some fish to eat. And basically, one of the, what is now perceived as one of the most um, artful, if not the most technical methods of, of fishing, was probably what evolved next as far as fishing, wouldn't that be uh, fly fishing? Because basically, fly fishing is uh, when when you have a reel on a fly rod. Basically, a fly rod is just a long pole, and the pole that the guys first used to to catch catfish or or trout or salmon or whatever they were catching were basically just long poles. And rather than tie the string to the end, somebody had the wise idea of putting some sort of little winding de wind up device on the end of, of the pole. And, <coughs> and basically, that's what a fly reel still is is just a reel, and there's no gears or anything in it. You turn it one time, and the reel inside goes around one time, it's just a place to store a line. Actually, when you are fly fishing, you don't use the reel in most applications. You pull the line in hand over hand, or you deal it out. First thing you do when you go and fly fishing, you get some line out on the ground, and then you, you start doing the, the fly mechanism. So, <clears throat> that was probably one of the next things that evolved. And the string that the, that the people used was uh, rather coarse. You know, they didn't have monofilament and things like that in those days, and that's what fly line was. You and, and fly fishing, the major difference between that and uh, fishing where you're casting a lure uh, is when you're casting a lure, it's the weight of the lure that pulls the line out. When you're fly fishing, it's the weight of the line that carries a fly that's made out of uh, uh, tiny bits of feather and yarn. Um, out to where you hope the fish is, is waiting to bite it. Another thing that these early fishermen <coughs> helped define that carried right on down through the ages is that basically most sport fishing methods nowadays, or almost all of them, involve trying to convince the fish that uh, to, to catch a fish morally and, and ethically nowadays, you have to get it to eat whatever it is that you're uh, trying to, to, to feed it. If a fish isn't hungry and you're not going to catch it, um, it's immoral to take a big hook and snag it or take a dip net and dip it out or something like that. You, know, you have to convince the fish that it's hungry and, and get it to feed. Um, the next step up in technology 
came with, I don't have any of the, of the real early model um, level wine bait casting reels, but, and this isn't a real late model either, but basically what, it, what they did was uh, they widened out the spool from what would be on a, on a fly uh, fishing rod. Uh, the, sh the line went from, from being thick coarse line down to uh, a line that was uh, manufactured basically out of, of uh, synthetic materials, nylon, Dacron, uh, materials like that that came about in the 40s and 50s and uh, was wound onto a revolving spool. A little mechanics involved uh, meant that you turn the handle one time and the spool would go around several times, giving the fisherman a mechanical advantage. And in the early models, um, basically, if, when the line went out, the handle went this way, and when the, you turned the handle the other way, the line came in. On, on the modern tackle, uh, basically, the line goes out and the handle doesn't move and you turn it and it engages and it pulls it back in. But <clears throat> this is called bait casting and ironically it's very seldom used to fish with live bait. <clears throat> then some guy that was really some sort of mechanical whiz came up with these ungainly looking things called spinning reels. And uh, they became quite popular in that they were, uh, you could cast a long ways and, and less prone to backlash, less the line less tangled. Uh, these were not even possible until they came up with monofilament <coughs> line um, because of the nature of the monofilament, it's somewhat springy, so when it loses pressure, billows up and it's easy for it to come flying off the reel. Uh, complex gear drive mechanism so that you flip the bale over this way and the line comes off and then you turn the handle and this thing flips around and there's all sorts of moving parts and gadgets and gizmos on there and um, <clears throat> those are still quite popular. The main reason that these are popular is that they're, they, they come in, in sizes from much smaller to this to big enough to catch sharks on and um, relatively inexpensive to make. Actually, the latest deal, and this is by no means a, a, a late model of them, but they're still made the same, it's called the spin cast. Basically, it has all the same gizmos on it that that last reel has, except they put it all inside this thing so you can't see all that stuff flying around and moving inside there, so it's not nearly as scary to use. And then it's just simple push button operation. You push the button and the line comes out and you turn the handle and the line comes back in. So it was very simple to use. So simple, in fact, that uh, most people tend to, to uh, go to trickier things to use just because it's trickier to use, not because they're really more efficient. And, uh, <clears throat> but these are good for children and people that are just getting into to fishing. And they're mass produced. So they're relatively inexpensive. Most of these run less than $20. They last a long time, too. That was probably 30 years <coughs> old. So uh, <coughs> that's somewhat the evolution of the reels. Now the rods, you know, the first one was a long stick that they cut down, probably a willow or something growing along the stream. Um, tended to be a little heavy, and then when somebody came back from China and brought back a bamboo stick, I thought, well, this is nice, it's a nice long pole, and, uh, and doesn't weigh nearly as much, so they, you know, use, use those, and um, then somebody invented how to take the bamboo pole and split it in a little, and glue it all back together, so you made a nice, compact, sleek-looking thing, and, and um, you know, you can still buy split bamboo rods, they cost several hundred dollars, and, um, uh, don't work any better than than uh, the new ones, but uh, uh, people like that are uh, into nostalgia type of things uh, enjoy fishing with with split bamboo rods. Um, I think after 
bamboo and wood and different um, materials came along. Um, probably the first mass produced rods and reels. And we're talking a lot of this has evolved since um, since World War II, so in the last 50 years, was uh, steel rods. I can still remember fishing with a steel rod when I was a young youngster. And then fiberglass came on the scene. And boy, that was really good because, you know, you could bend those things and they were whippy and they were light and it was cheap and it was tough. And, you know, that was quite a uh, revolution. And then different grades of fiberglass. The first ones were solid and they were heavy and then they came with tubular fiberglass and, and better resins and things like that. So the rods kept getting better and better. And now uh, there's space age composites of, of fiberglass and boron and graphite and, and other uh, things like that are used in, in the um, in spinning rods, but basically it all has to deal with getting the fish out of the water and up here where you can get your hands on it. As I said earlier, there basically are, are uh, we'll cover baits a little bit and then we'll have a few minutes for questions, but there's basically there's live bait and there's artificial bait. I wanted to say natural baits, but that's not exactly true because you take a worm, put it on a hook, you might think, well, how natural is that? You know, the water runs off of the, uh, the river bank and the worm that's crawling around falls into the river and the catfish eats the worm, so that's a real natural scenario. But I tell you what, you can take a night crawler and drape it on a hook and 35 miles out in the middle of Lake Erie and cast it out there in a walleye, never in its whole life ever seen a live worm will come up and eat it. I don't know how they know that it, they're supposed to do that, but uh, it's anything but natural, but it is a live bait. Basically, live bait uh, and natural baits like that, uh, you would think of minnows, uh, insects, you know, you can even buy crickets nowadays in a, in a bait shop. Uh, you can catch crickets, you can catch grasshoppers. I, I like going out in the fall, uh, catching some grasshoppers and, you know, put them in a jar and you pin a grasshopper and throw it out. And, and um, that's an excellent, excellent bait. And, um, and insect larva is used, especially for ice fishing. We're going to talk about ice fishing later on, so I'm sure he's going to get into that. Another one of those things. I don't know what kind of worms those are that you that you get on there, but I bet there's not any of them that fall into the lake in the middle of the winter normally, but <laughs> the fish eat them anyway. And then there's some other kinds of lot natural bait that really doesn't make any sense. My brother takes smelt, puts it on a hook, and catches northern down in the Iroquois River over by Brook, and I know those pike don't get see that many smelt swimming around in the, in the Iroquois. Um, I know guys that use shrimp, you know, saltwater shrimp, and catch catfish and things like that. And, and chicken liver is a great catfish bait. Now, how many chickens do you think go hiking down the river bank, up chuck their liver, you know, and it rolls into the stream and the catfish eats it? But it's very effective. But I think basically, um, you know, natural bait is, is something you take and you put on a bare hook. At least artificial bait is supposed to be something that imitates something that, that fish normally eat. You know, now, <clears throat> you know, there's artificial lure, at least it looks like a minnow. You know, it's supposed to pull more. You know, a plastic worm, it kind of looks like a worm. Now, once again, I don't know why, how many worms the fish actually get to eat, but Maybe it looks like a snake or a, or a lizard or some sort of creepy crawler thing, but it looks like something they're supposed to eat. And then even things like, like a spoon, which, you know, to me or you, that doesn't look very much like, uh, like a minnow, but, you know, turn the lights real down low and drag this by you real quick and figure your brain's about this big and you're thinking that most things that are, are swimming along through the water is something that you're supposed to eat and you can mistake this for a minnow. And, 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 and eat it. And then we can do tricky things where we take stuff like fish formula or scent and we smear it all over an artificial lure so 
no, no, it looks like a minnow, it smells like a minnow, or this one smells like a leech. Mm -hmm. So you can have a leech smelling minnow go swimming along, you know, and really confuse them. <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to touch base on with you on uh, a little bit about fish biology and a little bit about some of the history of sport fishing and, and some of the tactics, you know, I'm sure that there's three-fourths of the guys in the room and, and a lot of the you St. Joe kids that signed up uh, could probably teach the course as, as well as I and I, I wasn't um, if I brought some new information to you I'm, I'm thrilled um, one thing that fishermen are good at is you know we're never tired of talking about fishing and hearing fish stories and and uh, things like that so um, even if I was talking about something that, that you already knew about, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we do have a few minutes, I think, before you know, we want to take our break, so if anybody has any questions about anything, I, I should be glad to entertain it. Otherwise, we'll head to the cookie, cookie bar. Does anybody have any questions? Full of snoop. Yes. Uh, what about it? Well, uh, specifically, <laughs> it's 10,000 acres. I mean, okay, I know. But how, ice fishing this winter and spring okay. fishing. Okay, ice fishing this winter. Right now we have a lake that has um, lots of, of smaller sized bluegills in the lake. Um, we don't think that it's an ba uh, imbalance caused by predator prey where they're getting overpopulated from that point of view. Basically, it's the interaction with the carp that are suppressing the size of the bluegill. Bluegills are primarily sight feeders. They see something, they eat it. Not like catfish that they can smell it, not like bass that they can hear it swimming through the water and, uh, and attack it. And we have enough carp in the lake that the water is perpetually muddy. So instead of being able to see that far, they can only see this far or sometimes maybe only this far. And so they don't feed as effectively as, as they might if they have nice clear water to see in and so they don't grow as fast. <coughs> Basically, right now, most of the bluegills that are being kept are around six and a half inches long. Uh, seven incher is a real nice one for a little slough. Most places, a seven incher is about, you know, that's about as small as you want to keep. Um, and it's not going to change much, you know, it's going to be the same thing going into the spring. Uh, nice northern pike in the lake, uh, decent bass fishing right now, uh, and should be on into the spring. Good cat fishing for the people that like to fish for catfish, five, six, seven pound cats. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, if you have a small pond, we have two small stock ponds, and if you don't have if you're not a biologist and can't do surveys and stuff, do you just judge by what comes out, that, you know, what the balance is? Like if you're getting a lot of small bluegills, you keep them all? Or That's probably you know one, of the, one of the, the keys. Now, um, the DNR does have uh, fisheries biologists that for every part of the state. And uh, basically they will, they act as consultants for small pond owners. They have a variety of brochures and literature that you can get from them uh, that may or may not answer the specific question that you have. Uh, hopefully it will if you're still having some sort of a major problem that they can't just discuss in a few minutes over the phone. They may even stop by your pond and, and uh, you know, do an on-site inspection and, and, uh, and size up the situation there. Uh, the one thing that they won't do is do any work on it and they won't stock it because unless you want to open it to the public for fishing. Most people don't want to do that with their private ponds. But um, they will basically act as a consultant for you. And uh, if you want to write down our fisheries biologist phone number, it's 772-2353. That's for Northwest Indiana. I assume that you haven't driven too far in a night like this to get here. Do you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, I'm talking about Willow Slough. Mm -hmm. It's fairly shallow, right? Right. Does that have anything to do with the algae side and the grass growing and um, the quality of water? Sure. 
Uh, basically, the amount of weeds that grow in a lake has to do with the amount of sunlight that penetrates down to the bottom. And Does that affect the uh, fish quality or? Uh, well, we're not uh, quality. Uh, I'm, I don't know what you mean. I mean how well, how well they grow or or, yeah. or whatever. Uh, actually, it does, and it makes it a much more fertile lake. In most ponds, once you get down below the level that that the light can easily penetrate, um, you know, it's it's fairly sterile, uh, not pro not that productive of, of fish. It's the the shallow zone. You know, everything gets its energy from the sun, and and that's the most productive zone of the lake. Well, basically, Murphy Lake being only four or five feet deep, thousand acres that's that's productive instead of just a, a narrow band along the shoreline or islands that's productive. When when things are, are going good and, and at the times when we didn't have large carp populations in the lake, um, you know, the, the bluegill and, and bass fishing was phenomenal. It was like bluegills were born seven inches long and then and, and then they got big. You know, you didn't just didn't catch little ones anymore because they would grow probably twice as fast as bluegills in most most lakes of, in this latitude. Anybody else? Sometimes when you fillet a fish, can you find uh, little yellow grubs in them, or sometimes black specks in them? Where's, yes. How do you get? How do you get in the fish? Or? They come from snails, basically. It's a it's a parasite, and it's been far too many years since I took parasitology at college to really know all the, the names and everything. Most of them are um, go from a, a, from a bird, fish-eating bird, like a great blue heron, into the bottom sediments, into a snail, into the fish, and back into the bird, different parts of the life cycles of a parasite. Um, None of them are parasitic on man. Most parasites are very host specific. Um, you know, you can't even get a tapeworm from the tapeworms in a, in a rabbit. You know, they won't live in a human being. Um, <clears throat> so if you go ahead, even if you were to eat that fish raw, you would not end up getting these parasites boring through your belly and into your muscles or, or anything. The fact that you would cook it would necessarily kill it, even if it if it were in fact it's just that would would take care of it. Uh, so basically, it's cosmetic. Um, we don't have too many of the fish around here that gets the white grubs. That's more like in perch and stuff that you catch up in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And you know, I've I've eaten some of them that that just had a few and. You never know they're there once they're cooked up, and and um, and if they're really bad, I throw them away. You know, just the idea of eating it. But you know, if you if you did, the little black specks basically the same sort of thing. But but the little um, filaria, I think they call them, I, the little grubs that come out of there never develop into that large of a worm that that's really visible. A lot of that stays right on the skin, and when you skin them out, it goes away. Okay, I'll be around the rest of the What can you do to get rid of carp? Like if you have like a lot of carp in there? Well, right now, there's not any any good way. Uh, what the DNR does, if they can do it, is they kill every carp in the whole watershed. Uh, so if you're talking about the Wabash River, you know, that's quite an undertaking, or even a major reservoir like Raccoon Lake or something like that. Although they have tried on um, on some of the large reservoirs like that. At Willow Slough, back in 1978, they drained the whole water, the, the lake down. Looked on maps, we found every drainage ditch that led into the lake. Got hundreds of gallons of, of fish poison. <clears throat> dozens of unwilling fisheries biologists to carry the fish poison through the poison ivy and raspberry bushes and things and uh, drain the whole lake down and 
any place there was any standing water, we applied fish poison to kill all the fish that was in the lake. So then when we closed the dam uh, and reflooded it, we started off with basically no fish and then stocked the type of fish that we wanted. And, um, and that worked really well for a number of years. But uh, nothing's perfect, and in, in the flat land that we have around here, uh, all the ditches eventually interconnect somehow or another. Uh, people may have brought cart minnows in as bait. Uh, we may not have killed the last carp in the lake. Maybe we killed all of them but two. <laughs> you know, and nature finally had its course, and, and they had babies, and now we have all their ancestors in there. Tried it again in 1988, and it did not work nearly as well. We had carp back in the lake almost immediately, so that's about the only thing. What I'm looking for is one of you bright young college students to come up with genetically engineered carp aids or something <laughs> like that, you know, so we can go up to our dam and we dump a little vial of this stuff in there and every carp falls over dead. <laughs> and uh, that would be a wonderful thing. Has to be okay. specific, though. Very it? specific. Yeah, That's right. Wanted. Very whole specific. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. We're going to take our break now. Yeah. Boy Scout, about 13, 14 years old, I decided I wanted to get the fishing merit badge. So I bought a, a kit where you could make your very own lures, and I started carving lures, painting them, and took them out fishing to a uh, big pond called the Morrow, Bar, Morrow Pit there in Madariaville. And uh, it was supposed to have some bass in it. And I fished for about two hours and all I caught was mostly mosquito bites. Okay, let's and uh, finally, I said, I'm going home. So I reeled it in fast and I caught the most beautiful 15 inch bass you ever saw. Got it right behind the gill. Brought it in, flipping and flopping, and the native fisherman came over and looked at that and said, Why, you snagged that. you got to put that back. And I looked at him and I said, No. This, this is the only fish I ever caught in my life, man. I didn't, I didn't take it back. I took it home. Walt Teach. He met Walt last week. Walt is a master of many things. And one thing he does I've never been able to understand. And I hope to tonight. Ice fishing. <laughs> what? Well, in the first place, let's get it right. I fish through the ice. I'm not an ice fisherman. I fish through the ice. I don't want everybody to think I'm a little bit on the head. Now, this has become a very popular sport. People have discovered they can get outside without freezing to death. That and the fact that you can get clothing to keep warm. And so it gets you away from that uh, television set. And uh, this time of year, I think everybody's been fed up with the bowl games. We got one more to go. Not only that, it gets out there and you get your exercise and you lose a few calories, a few pounds. That's the second advantage. The only disadvantage is people think you're nuts. <laughs> Now, the first requirement, you got to have a pond or a lake with at least three to four inches of good hard ice. Now, if you have some farmer with a farm pond to stock or somebody that owns one of the spoil pits along I-65, you got them made. I fish over Willow Slough. I know about those little six and a half inch boogie is pretty good size for me. <laughs> Most generally, they're about three inches long and uh, that's about it. But you've got to be careful over there because sometimes you have some people that really don't know what they're doing. They'll cut a hole 16 inches plus in diameter. You can fall on those things. They'll skim over with ice. Your drifting snow will cover them up and then you come walking in. The first thing you know, you're doing a one-legger right down the hole. When that happens, Get off the ice in a hurry because if it's about 10 above zero, by the time you get to your car, why your pants leg will be frozen so stiff, you'll be walking like a pig leg. Now, what to wear? 
Wear plenty. <laughs> you can always take it off once you get there. But if you're out there and you start freezing and shivering and uh, shaking so bad you can't see your pole end, why, it's miserable. So you want to be comfortable in the first place. But don't get carried away. It, uh, it was like we said last week on camping, you layer the clothes. You walk out, you take your parka and lay it in the sled and, or whatever you're carrying, and you don't put it on until after you get your holes cut. You're allowed two holes, or as many as you want to cut, but you're only allowed three poles. And you, on each, each pole you can have two hooks. So, that's your legal limit, as far as pole is concerned. That doesn't say you're going to catch more fish, but I've seen a time where two poles were more than enough to keep you busy. And sometimes you gave up on the second pole and just used the, the single pole. Now, to show you what I wear out there, uh, if you have a snowmobile suit, you got it made, or a ski suit. But it's just like we had last week, you start off with your uh, thermal underwear that we had. This is show and tell, by the way. You go and get thermal underwear, and that goes over your other underwear. That's your second layer. And then it's sort of cold, by then you get your quilted underwear out and put it over top of there. Now you just begin to get comfortable. <coughs> then you ought to have down mittens. And I use insulated coveralls. They were just about a third as much as what a snowmobile suit was. And uh, they have a real good tough cover on it. The snowmobile suits tend to be uh, Oh, a nylon cover or an orlon, whatever it is, and they tend to tear a little bit, and if you get too close to somebody's charcoal burner, you'll burn a hole in them. But this is just a great set of uh, construction insulated overhauls, and I put my own hood on there. You gotta keep all that wind, because that's what really kills you off temperature-wise. I don't have the chart with me, but when it's down about 10 above zero, if you got a 15 mile an hour wind, why it probably puts you about 30 below. And it doesn't take much to freeze you up on that. And a pair of cotton gloves. You use those to uh, do your uh, manual work, and when you sit down to do your ice fishing on your sled or your bucket, why I go to down mittens. Then this, this can replace that uh, hood on your uh, outfit. And top it all off, I got what they call a trooper hat. It's uh, real snug and sometimes they think I look like a teddy bear, but at least I'm warm. <laughs> so I'll say that for it. Now, to top it all off, at the bottom, on some warm days you can probably get by with just a pair of straight overshoes. Now these are Canadian packs. The rubber, the leather top, the felt lining like Mark had last week. And they're usually more than enough if it's oh, 25 and above. Now if it gets a little colder than that, you get what they call the Mickey Mouse boots. Those were developed during the Korean War. <coughs> the troops were getting frostbit over there and uh, on the toes, so they come up with a pair of Mickey Mouse boots. The name says for itself. But then if it gets really cold, you go for the kind you can pump up. Now believe it or not, the all three fit me. I got big feet. <laughs> but these have an air pump on them, these will take you down five below, you can stand out there and fish if nobody watches you. Otherwise, they wonder, what in the world are you doing there? <laughs> now, it doesn't have to be expensive to fish. In fact, it's one of the most economical ways to fish that you can find. You can fish with a pole, or you can fish just strictly with a drop line. And once you get on the ice, why, what I usually do, I walk out to where the other people are fishing. 
I don't like to be the first on the ice because I don't want to swim. <laughs> so I wait till they, somebody else has walked out across there, you go out and see what they're fishing for and what they're catching with, if they are. And usually you don't even have to have a, any means to cut the hole because there's people will cut holes and abandon it and move somewhere else. Well, there might not be any fish where they cut it the first time, but they just might not be good fishermen. So you always try that. You can do the whole morning. All you need is a line, a bobber, and a small hook, and some bait. Now, to carry your stuff out on the ice, I use a plastic bucket if there's a lot of snow on the ice. And it's a lot easier to carry. Your poles are just lightweight uh, fiberglass poles. I use two pound and four pound test line. I have a small bobber. It's uh, real small as you can see. And then the ice jig that you use, or the one I use, is that size there. Now you can always catch fish on a little hook. But if you got a big hook, the only thing you can catch is big fish. And like Mr. Schoonfield says, there's no big fish over the slough anymore. So <laughs> you use the little fish, or the little one. <coughs> but if you decide to cut your own hole, why, I have what they call a nice spoon. It's got a... Phew, I'll cut my finger. It's a protector. It's all you do is sit there and just drill right down into the ice. Hopefully, it cranks right in, and you do this if the ice is all 12 inches thick or more. Otherwise, you can use what they call a spud bar. That's strictly a steel pole with a chisel on the end. It's a little more noisier, but it gets you just about the same amount of exercise. But I have seen people over the slough use an axe to cut the hole through the ice with. Of course, those are the ones that usually end up cutting the holes that's big enough to fall into. <laughs> a little bucket. I usually have a seat for it. That's what they call a skimmer because about the first five minutes you're Ice hole starts giving up with ice, so you got to keep the ice clear of it. Otherwise, your bobber freeze in, you can't tell if you got a bite or not. This is just strictly a little homemade charcoal burner. Put the charcoal in there, a little bit of charcoal fluid, and it'll burn real good. About uh, 12 little old briquettes will burn for about half a day or more. And by the time you get your hands wet and you take all those fish off the line, why, you want something to warm them up. And that's one of the simplest ways to do it. The whole idea is that when you start off ice fishing, don't go out and spend 500 bucks. You can get by with five for two poles. The rest of it you can scround or you can make. This is nothing but a dairy skimmer. Two coffee cans and a paint bucket. I can listen in the paint bucket is a McDonald's pickle bucket. <laughs> so if you keep your eyes open, decide that if you invest a lot of money in it and you find out you don't like it, then you really feel bad. <laughs> now then, I had some children that had sleds, so any kid sled with a box on the sled makes a good thing to haul your gear out with. Now this one I have the same thing on this as here. This I had this for an improvement. One of my scouts gave that to me years ago. Now these poles here are the same type except on this one I have what they call a a uh, spring end to it. That's your real stick too tight. Now I use the bobber to get my depth 
after you cut your hole, while you have a what you call a, a depth fighter, all it is is a sinker with a clamp on it. You hook it on your little jig down here, and you leave it down to where the line doesn't go down any farther, and you know you're on bottom. So then you set your, your bobber so you'll be about anywhere from four to six inches above bottom. Then you can, once you get that established, well, you can pull your uh, bobber up off the water and, and strictly go by this real sensitive end. I'm nervous enough, it looks like a whole good fish bite in there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you, it's a uh, friend of mine, what they call tight lining. And he can sit there and catch twice as many fish as I can, and, but he can do it by the field. But I've never been that good at it. Now this, of course that's self-explanatory there. You sit on it a while and it doesn't get pretty warm. Also, you can get these pretty reasonable anymore. They're what they call a heat pack. They're good for up to 18 hours. All you do is shake them up a little bit and stick them in your pocket and it's 140 degrees. And usually at the spring of the year, why your stores will sell out on that kind of stuff, so that's when you keep your eyes open and make your good bargains. This is you know that is just a plain white gas lantern. Now sometimes they're dumb enough to stay out after dark and, and you gotta have some light to see your bobber go down, so that works, but it really puts off a lot of nice heat to keep your hands warm. That's why I put the hole in the window here, of the window at the end of the slit. Believe it or not, it works. It really fits to go out good. Then the hard ice, you need these ice cleats. I'm out to slough where the wind has been so strong I could walk on the ice and I've seen the fellow fishermen going in pushing their buckets ahead of them because they couldn't stand up right they just stand the wind and start pushing them back. So I remember pretty dumb sometimes but you know you, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I've got a tackle box too. <laughs> now these is what I use for bait. I use bee moth or wax worm or spikes, but the bait shop was closed. I discovered these little things. They're called power wigglers. You just take one of them and, and tip it on your jig, on your pole, and the fish can't tell the difference between that and a bee moth larva, and they go for it. But then you can also if you're anywhere near a, a, a cornfield that has standing corn stalks, a lot of times you can find corn borers in the stock. That's one of your best baits. Years ago, we used to go over to slough, we stopped by the cornfield and pick them up. But farmers have gone to pesticide now where you don't have corn borers as much. So you're out there. Of course, you use goldenrod uh, <coughs> larva, or I pick up hickory nuts. Pick up the hickory nuts in the fall of the year and you toss them in a plastic pail with a little bit of sand or a little bit of sawdust in the bottom. And along about ice fishing time, you shake it up and lo and behold, all the hickory nut larvae or worms in there have crawled out into your sawdust. The fish like those too. Now the best thing about ice fishing is it's cheap. It doesn't take a whole tackle box or a whole lot of gear to go with it. This right here is enough to last me probably for the next three or four years, barring snags. But uh, it's real economical. And like I said before, these baits, they run about 15 cents a piece if you buy them right at the right time of year. You buy them during the winter time though, and they're probably about 50 cents a piece. So you buy them when the time is right. I buy my two pound mount of film up by the 100 yards, or this, I guess this here is 250 yards. That's the four pound, and then I have the two pound test. Then you need one of these 
forceps or a, or a uh, pair of needle nose pliers because the dog on a little gill, they get, by the time you get around to it, they've got to screw down into their stomach almost, and you've got to get it out. It's a little hard to cut off and abandon the jig because your fingers are cold, you can't tie on a new one. If you get too close to that lantern, you melt it, so. Then sunglasses, they're a must, especially on bright days. Because you can go snow blind in, in a, a, a small amount of time. <coughs> and then to carry the fish off the ice, if I get any, I need to use a, this here I think is an orange bag. So I see it, it's cheap. It's cheap to fish, but it's uh, more more fishing time actually than you do if you were in a boat. Besides that, it'd probably take you half a day to cut a hole big enough to get the boat in the water. <laughs> now you can. You had Mark. <laughs> you can go overboard on this if you decide you like it. You can go overboard. You can buy these fancy uh, fish huts. They're portable. They're, you can put them up in a hurry and take them down in a hurry. And they'll run on anywhere from $189 on up. Or you can buy, right, and you can buy a fish locator that you can sweep away the ice and spray a little bit of windshield cleaner on it, set it on there, and you can find what the bottom is. I hear they make them so strong now that you can even see the fish swimming by. But by the time you get your hole cut up, my man is long gone. <laughs> uh, But uh, most of all, as we go back to where we said before, be prepared. Uh, you can get carried away. You can sit there and all of a sudden the fish will start biting. You sit there all day maybe. And the fish will start hitting and, uh, and uh, you're concentrating on it so hard that you really don't know what's going on around you. And when they first put the aerators, you know, at Willow Slough, the big bluegill moved into where the water was kept open. <coughs> And so the fishermen would get as close to the edge as they could to put their holes down. And I was over there one afternoon and watched fishermen cut the holes around got the guy that was sitting out there and he floated out and when they got up, he tipped over and down he went. <laughs> and finally somebody got up and threw him a rope. They weren't about to lose the hole. The hole because the fish were biting. So you think we're nuts? You're right. <laughs> okay, that's all for me. <laughs> in, case, in case you're wondering about the name of my sled, it's not the name of my sled, it's a kismet. That's keep it simple and make it fun. <laughs> Thank you, Walt. But, uh, I don't know. Six, eight years ago, Father Bennett uh, had a group of us for dinner <clears throat> out at St. Joe, and he uh, called it a bluegill dinner. He started with bluegill salad, bluegill soup, uh, roasted bluegill. What else? Bluegill ice cream, I think, was the dessert. Oh, no, no. 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 <laughs> but he likes to catch all kinds of fish. Uh, but tonight we picked bluegills because of that bluegill dinner and his association with bluegills. Father Bennett, who came up from Texas, by the way, just to talk. And you're paying my way, we're going to take up a collection. <laughs> $183, I think I have to have. First of all, uh, there's a lake out St. Joe called Lake Bonnets. It's uh, very clearly printed there on a sign. And that is Lake Bonnet. It's not Lake Bennett. There's a building out there that's Bennett. Spelled the same way. 
Charlie Halleck wanted the lake to be named after me, so I'm not allowed to have anything named after me except those things that I can control. So. The urinals in Bennett Hall were named after me. <laughs> they never consulted me about that. So I said if they were going to name it that, with that spelling, it had to be Bonnet. That's my family name. But I go by the name of and Coach Hogan's uh, daughter, Sally, wrote an essay here at St. Augustine's about her fishing trip on Lake Bonnet. And then she said, and after we had been there for a while, Father Bennett came, B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, and visited with us. So she caught the thing very well. I, everything he's got here I've had. <laughs> I even had one of those fish finders. But uh, I've fished all over the world for everything that, he, that Mike has on his, on his uh, shirt there. But bluegill fishing is my, my satisfying fishing. I live in Texas, and there's, there's all sorts of things down there. You've got the ocean trout, and you've got the, the red snappers, you've got the, those things on the bottom. But I don't like this. Lake Bonnet was originally a, a pit, Kreitzer's sand pit. And it was just a small lake. I mean, small pond. And the priest used to go to Willow Slough, and whatever we caught in a sack, like his sack, usually a gunny sack, and we would take it, and we'd dump it in the lake, and the fish that swam away and stayed, what floated, we ate. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the way we got fish into that lake. There was a federal hatchery, which it was nice because we didn't have to make it a public lake. Federal Hatchery over at Rochester, and they were abandoning it. In fact, if you go by driving by there, now you see those little depressions. Those were, were breeding ponds, and they were going to discontinue it. So Father Fernbacher and Bonnie Dryling and I went over and asked them if we could buy some of those because they were going to abandon it. How many you want? <laughs> they followed us back with a big tank full of, of these great big bull bluegills, the big black ones, you know, and uh, they just dumped them in the lake. Everything went well. We didn't know how to balance the lake because of bass fishing. Bass fishing was so easy, and we overfished it, and we got stunted bluegills. And then we had the, you guys, with your shocker boats out there and they made a, a survey of the lake and gave us percentages of kinds of fish and what we should do to bring them up. And they did tell us not to take any mm -hmm. bass beyond 14 inches, or below 14 inches, because um, we can't stop poachers. But pretty soon our bass started getting, our bluegills started getting bigger. And they said, don't take any of those 10 inches out, because they're the ones that are voracious. You know, they'll, they'll eat all those little bluegills if you let them. And everything was fine, and uh, it wouldn't be anything, you know, to go out there on an afternoon, and, or in the morning and afternoon, and catch 150 bluegills was nothing. And seven inches, about the way they'd be. Eight, some, 10. Somebody in local community is not here. But he took the dynamite, and he was dynamiting the lake on his own, and the fishing just disappeared. But one afternoon I came out, and I saw all these fish floating around, and I saw him loading his car. And it suddenly dawned on me why the fishing was no good. I wanted to have him arrested. People told me you can't prove it, and I took I took uh, samples and I gave them to the you guys to uh, down at Purdue. Had them look at it, see if they could demonstrate that those were shocked by dynamite. And they said they couldn't. So we let it alone. And in about three years, our bluegills suddenly were in 10 and 11 inches. <laughs> because they got rid of all the little ones. 
Now, you guys are interested in fishing out there. I have nothing to do with it. But we do allow, I think, <coughs> 12. When I was giving out passes, I gave out uh, 12 students. But actually, it wouldn't make any difference now. I, after listening to you and my own judgment, is that there's no way you could fish those bluegill out of there. But you could fish the bass out if people were would discipline themselves. They're the more fun to catch bass if you like bigger fish. But a bluegill, if you use the right kind of tackle, like this two and four pound test, that bluegill can give you more fun than any big bass. They whip around there and you got a good steady pull with some of the poles he described. You you got as big a thrill as you can get in fishing. So light tackle is the most thrilling of the fishing in any bluegill environment. Now I've fished bluegill everywhere. I've fished that little slough. I've fished over here at Wonemac. we fished the rivers. we fished the ponds. We've, I've been in Canada, Alaska. I've been in South America. I've been all over the world fishing. But right in Lake Bonnet, I've had the most fun fishing that I can think of. Well, one time I went fishing in the, the uh, Thousand Islands down there in Fort Meyer or one of those places and fish with those little red snappers. Or little, and the, somebody taught me how to do it. And I started filling up the boat. And the guide took off. I said, you don't want to clean those, do you? <laughs> 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 you got your perceptive. I fillet my fish. Now that's what I was trying to tell Mrs. Kim. I fillet my fish and I do all sorts of things with them. With the smaller ones, I'll marinate them. And they marinate real well and you can treat them just as though you would fish. You're treating a uh, shrimp. Just put them on ice, dip them in, in that sauce, and just like fish. You put them in a soup. You can brown them. You can uh, broil them, I guess. We, had, we did have everything but ice cream. <laughs> that was one of my efforts. But if you get a, the larger bluegills, if you flay them, you know, they, they flay easy. Now the problem with the little ones is that you have to be skilled to fillet them. And I became so skilled that I can fillet a minnow in the dark. <laughs> and that's why you can make those little shrimp fillets, and that, that's the kind you were talking about. And I can fillet those. The skill comes with practice, but if you get a good sharp and keep your your uh, Rapala knife sharp, you can cut those things off. And she was complaining about catfish, and I said, they're easier to fillet than then the bluegill. You get around that big horny backbone, get a fillet, and shoo, that skin comes off just like that. And our catfish out there range 10 pounds, 12 pounds. They're great, big channel cats. But I'm talking about bluegill, and you can go out there and catch all the bluegills you want, and you can catch your, you can catch a catfish by just having a line all on its own, separate. The colors of our, cat, our bluegills vary because we took bluegills from the Willow Slough, we took bluegills from Winnemac, we took bluegills from other guys' ponds, so you've got pumpkin seeds out there, you've got the speckled ones out there, you've got uh, red ears. But the bluegills we want are like these. And those are the ones we've got from, got these from the federal government. And since the federal government gave them to us. <laughs> now this is the record that, as far as we know. This was caught there. That's 12 inches. But that's what the bluegills that we catch look like. Now, I'm lying. Look. <laughs> <laughs> but that's their color. This, this kind of blackish color and purple sides. This is a male with a red, red uh, breast. The females are usually white or yellow, but they get this big and they're kind of thinner. 
in the big belly. That's a male. And I say, this fella is, as far as we know, the record in Lake Bonnet. Some people say they've caught bigger ones than that, but I don't know. They've never reported it or showed it to us. That one was caught about four years ago by a local person, not a student. Students are the ones who catch the bigger ones. <laughs> now, uh, a bluegill is called up here bluegill. It's a sunfish class. Your bass are sunfish also. They also call them, down where I am, they call those brim or bream. The bluegill. In South America where I fished them, they're called Wahara. Wahara. And they get, they get like that, 15, kind of a humpback but they're bluegills. And I am a professional filleter because the guides told me I can't eat those, they're too bony. And I said, why? There's nothing to them, you know? And I, so I showed the guides, and they sat around in a, watching me fillet those fish. Then they wanted to do it, and I corrected them. And the next day I wanted to clean the fish they wouldn't let them, <laughs> because that's their job. They're professionals now. <laughs> and the reason I went fishing for Oaxaca is because the first cast, and that's Rio Colorado de Norte, the first cast I made, I caught my tarpon, a 110-pound tarpon, the first cast. And I came from here, sitting at a desk for nine, ten months, going down there and suddenly having to fight 110 pound tarpon, I didn't feel like doing anything again, you know. That was probably about as exhausting as you can get. And the guides will not help you. It's your it's yours. If you want to give them the line, they just cut it, let it go. And you're not allowed to keep them unless you're going to use it as a trophy. So I kept mine for a trophy. <laughs> but anyhow. Bluegill fishing in Lake Bonnet is a, is, is, a, is a lot of fun, but you don't have the access to the lake that I do. I have a pontoon boat, that, and we allow very few boats on there. You don't have one, do you? Not anymore. Not anymore. It sunk. <laughs> <laughs> the dynamite hit it. <laughs> but as far as bluegill fishing is concerned, you have to remember that Lake Bonnet is a pit. It's not a lake. It's three feet out and you're down 30 feet. The average depth of that uh, pit is about, I'd say 35 feet. It's varied. Now, the Kreitzers had that as a gravel pit and they sold gravel to you. But they had a contract with I-65, and they had to do all the overpasses, I think, from Rensselaer to Lowell. And they, they, took, they took that sand and gravel out of there so fast that suddenly the lake got real big. Now, where you go swimming over there, they kept butting into clay, so they had to back off. They needed sand and gravel, and they went, instead of going out towards the south, they had to go west, and they made a better lake, and also gave you a park up there. <clears throat> if they had had their original purposes, you wouldn't have had the park. So God provided, even then, for us, <laughs> we had this beautiful little beach. <clears throat> now, right off the beach is, is good fishing. And uh, the best fishing, of course, is about the end of May, when you left already from school, until about, I'd say the middle of June. And you'll see on the shallows little colonies, little fanned out places, and you'll see one of these fellows chasing everybody away. Now the way I understand it, now this is, the biologists will tell you, 
that they are very productive. One bluegill, maybe she lays about 15,000 eggs, but then three or four of them may lay their eggs on that nest, or she may lay it in a series of a couple of weeks. But the guarding is done by the males, and they won't let anybody in there. And they usually have these nests close to weed patches, so that when they do hatch, they can go out and be safe from even their old man. I don't know whether the males eat them, but they're supposed to chase them into the grass and, and survive. Later on, after the middle of June, you have to go down deep. You can go out in the morning, early morning, and you can catch bluegills pretty easily. You can go out late evening and catch them pretty easily. But during the day, you have to have a boat. You have to be able to go down 10, 15 feet. That's where they are. They're out on beds down there, and they're trying to stay out of the hot sun. That's, that's the reason for it. But the fishing is good if you have a boat. And you can catch fish during the day if you have a boat and willing to catch them. Bluegills, they, they're in colonies, right? There's always about 10, 15 of them always together. You catch one, you might as well just stay there, because that's, there's going to be a lot more of them. They're not, they're not singles. They're not solo, solo. But once you catch one, stick in that spot, you'll probably catch more. Unless it's a little one. If it's a little one, he's probably up close to the shore, right? <coughs> but the bluegills like that don't come very often. But I would say, after the dynamiting, and after the government analysis of what that lake needed, we now do catch a lot of 10, 11 inch bluegills in that lake. And that lake is uh, clean, it's clean water. It's not spring fed, it's what you would call water that's entrapped in the sand and gravel. A lot of people think it's spring fed, there's no springs. Now those clay beds maybe will ooze a little water. That's just the water that's in all of the pits from the Iroquois River all the way out 10, 15 miles. Same body of water. If you cleared away all the sand and gravel on those farms, out going out past uh, What's, what's over there in Monon, you'd have the same water. It's clear water and trapped in the sand and gravel. What do you call it? Perch water. That's what it is. It's not a, a stream-fed body of water, so it's perfect water for bluegills. They like clean water. And let's see, what do you fish with? You talked about your little bitty things. I'd say a number six hook, a six pound, eight pound test line. Put your shot, shots, very few shots, about six to 12 inches above your hook. Use your worms, crickets, larvae is winter fish. But if you have larvae, it's fine. You get these little grubs. What do you call those things? You can buy them down here. Bee moth. Bee moth. You can use bee moth. But what you have to do, you have to see what they're biting on. Some days they're on bee moth. Some days they won't take a night crawler. Some days they won't take bee moth. So you try cricket. And uh, that's normal. My kind of fishing. I used <coughs> to fish with flies. And I used to go out in the morning in the boat and back troll. And I had a little plastic white chips with a bell weight on them, and I'd, I'd spot the center of all these nests, and I'd drop one. Then when I'd come out later, any time of the day when they're on the nest, and I would fly cast towards that little button, you know, <laughs> I used wet flies, because they would go right down along the bottom. If you're out there when there's a hatch of uh, well, you, you can see activity on the surface, then you want a dry fly. And for a dry fly, they tell you what to use in little 
little springy leg thing. Or uh, there are millions of different kind of flies for dry and wet. And a wet fly, if you're going to go down, and you never go down if they're up on the surface. But if you can't get them on the surface, then get a wet fly and go down. That's in Lake Bonnet. What else you want to know? <laughs> How to fillet? I, was, I, I tried to, to get a, a, someone to bring a bluegill in, and there's about six people been out fishing and haven't brought in a bluegill to see me fillet one. But filleting is the, my idea. I don't like bones, and uh, I think if you knew how to fillet, you wouldn't like them either. Now she likes to have them just scaled and, and fried. What do you want to know? <clears throat> how I make ice cream? <laughs> <laughs> still have that can't fish until after June 15th. Well, the reason for that is so that we can control the entry on there. Because when the fish are on the beds, people like this now know <laughs> that they're on the beds. And they, they sneak in there and they know you can fish them at night. That's why I want to bring that up. You don't want them out there. So. I don't care what happens out there. You don't? Mm -hmm. I have no control over that lady. <laughs> in fact, the, Probably change the name and, and tag uh, tag it someone something else. <laughs> if, if you're allowed to fish in there, I don't know. It's, you'd have to inquire from Dr. Shannon whether he's going to allow fishing out there and how much. <coughs> I uh, said I had I limited it to 12 students. It is a small small place, but the reason we didn't want more out there is because it's too easy to catch bass. It's a very easy lake to catch bass on if you know bass fishing. It's a very easy place to catch bluegills if you know about bedding and spawning. But it's a hard place to catch bluegills when you're fishing in the late summer. But it's an easy place to fish for bluegills if you have a boat and you know where they are. <laughs> but it is not a lake. It's a pit. And it's a very dangerous place, too. And we have to carry insurance because it's a dangerous pit. It's not the kind of place you could put a lot of houses around it. Because you don't, you don't have shorelines. You, don't, you can't walk five feet out, ten feet, you know, except there in that one swimming area. It's just a down you go. And that's deep. There's one place I think that uh, Kreitzer told me is about 50 foot because the water was real low when that scoop was going. And that scoop was 36 feet. So that's why I say it's about a 35 foot average. But the water was way low and they, and they were scooping out and made a big deep hole. Earlier on, they just had a big scoop. Remember that? They used to just scoop it out, sand and gravel. Yes? Did that the drainage tile that you have draining in there affect the pit any? I don't know. I think it did. Uh, when we put up the uh, Hanson building, right? And they had that big big roof surface, the water, the runoff couldn't be controlled and it was backing up into the field house. So they had to make a big tile open ditch <coughs> for the rainwater. Now today there's a lot of water suddenly and that runs off into the lake now. But I don't think, uh, I don't think a lot of it does. I thought that, when they put that tile in, I thought the fishing went down. Right away. That's when there was dynamiting out there. Well, at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but I quit that. <laughs> I told you I didn't like that. No, it, it may have. I, I, I don't know. I, I, it has not affected my fishing. But I can fish where you can't. I used to be able to. I don't know whether Shannon's going to cut that out too. I don't know. 
Anything else? No. Thanks for inviting me. Well, we hope to see you all next week.